so happy to see you all. So as we start this evening, shall we just take a moment and be present with one another? If you're looking at the screen in gallery view, you can look at all the beautiful people if you would like, or just feel how we are connected with one another and this container that we're creating for this evening's dialogue. Just feel the love flowing between us and amongst us. The energy of compassion and grace. Take a moment to know how connected we each are with one another. Thank you. My name is Sokini. Welcome to the Compassion Dialogue for February. And I'm one of the organizers with William and others for these uh, talks. This evening, William will be speaking with Kate Schur. And towards the end of our conversation, there will be some time for Q&A. If you have a question, please write it in the chat box as we go along and I will feed them in to William and Kate as we get to the Q&A section. If you have other questions and comments and thoughts, please send them to me in the chat box. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to William and our evening. Okay, and can I see Kate as well? Where's Kate? Are we not on together yet? There we go, the two of us, hooray. Everybody, uh, because of the um, kind of sensitivity of the topic, um, why don't we take an, another minute's pure quiet and just 100% allow ourselves to settle into um, what can be a poignant issue for many people, as well as an exciting one. Let's take a minute's quiet some more. Okay, thank you. Welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much, Kate, for coming into this conversation. Let me, let me tell everybody a little bit about how I got to know you and asked you, invited you in. Um, Kate and I were in a series of classes together and I'm gonna be very shallow for a, a, a in opening this. And I kept noticing Kate because I liked what she was wearing. She'd, <laughs> she'd, she'd come in wearing these great co color coordinated outfits, but they weren't just color coordinated. They were smart and slightly elegant. They were kind of way uh, upper class hippie type elegance that wasn't at all hippie in actual fact. And I just enjoyed, um, I enjoyed the eye candy of the colors actually over, over a series of weekends. And then um, to kind of elevate ourselves from that uh, shallowness, um, we started to chat. And I knew that Kate had a background in um, education and therapy, but I didn't know that she was a funeral director. So that was the beginning of me being very curious uh, about her and her work, because as some of you know, I've been doing um, passing over workshops for 30, 40 years since my own very uh, out of the body and near death experiences. Um, so this evening, I, I can see the conversation kind of flowing at least over three areas. Um, one is, of course, Kate's early years and how it what, what there is in the foundation of her life that would lead to her being in this metier now. 
And then I'm um, very curious about how she moved from education and counselling with people who are alive into caring for people who were no longer alive. And uh, all kinds of, as you know, in the emails I sent out, I made some probably um, unsuitable wry comments about that, whether they were easier clients to manage than um, live ones. And then I want to, we can explore together what is, what is actually like for someone who's empathic, has counseling skills, has a spiritual perspective as well. What, what is it actually like to be working with a dead body in a, in a very kind of intimate way over, over several days and keep the conversation away maybe from family that's experiencing grief, but just to be honed in on what's the experience like with the deceased and the sense of the journey of the deceased as well. And then maybe, um, only if we have time, we'll move on to some practical questions. And if we don't have time for all the practical questions, um, we'll put up the um, link to Kate's website and you can contact her directly afterwards. So Kate, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Really grateful. Would you just tell us how did you, what, what was going on for you as a little girl that could possibly lead you to becoming a funeral director? Well, um, I grew up in a, a rectory. My dad was a Church of England <clears throat> clergyman. And um, my, in those days, the rectory was usually next to the churchyard. It's a bit different now. But uh, so my playground was a, was a graveyard. So from a very early age, I was quite used to going and, and playing amongst the graves in a very overgrown graveyard that we had. So I got quite used to that. And of course, I was when I started to answer the phone as a child, I'd often answer to a funeral director and um, or would be answering the phone to people who were recently bereaved. And my dad used to let me go to some of the funerals with him, uh, particularly if they were very small funerals and there weren't going to be, you know, the, the Virgie was on holiday or something and he'd, he'd get me up to give the books out and he'd give me 50p to do that uh, instead of paying the Virgie. So um, I, I just preferred, the, I used to go to the weddings as well, but I much preferred the funerals because they just seemed a lot more somehow, a lot more honest. And um, I just, I don't know, I just thought, some of the some of the weddings were perhaps a little bit false but the, the funerals and I thought you know I wonder how that's going to end up but the funerals uh, you kind of knew how it was well do we know how it was ending up I don't know so that was that was my introduction really I, I can't you, remember. let me ask you a question I'd love to know <clears throat> when you were a child in the graveyard yeah what was that like for you? Was that a, a, a just a, like a playground, or were you what what, what 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 were you doing there? Were you playing games? What was your sense of it as well, a child? I used to have friends come round, and we'd go and play hide and seek and things like that in the in the graveyard. And to me, it was just normal. I mean, it it, it was I knew there were dead bodies in there, but it it was just it was normal. I, I can't remember a time when. You know, we moved to that place when I was three and I can't remember anything before that. So it, it was always just quite normal to have all these people in a field effectively next to where I was living and sleeping. And um, yeah, it was just it was just totally, totally normal for me. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm wondering, therefore, whether at a certain level there was kind of muscle memory, cellular memory that is it's absolutely okay to be with dead people, dead, dead, dead people mm -hmm. you know? So it's part and parcel of your makeup. I mean, the, my grand died when I was nine and she was the first person in our house because she lived with us. And she was the first person I saw dead. Um, and uh, so, you know, that was, 
that was fine. I don't remember that as being at all scary. It was, it was absolutely fine. Uh, and she was a great playmate of mine. So, we, you know, we, we got on very well. We were very close. But she was 88 and it was time for her to go. So. And did you have any, did you have any sense of, I'm, I'm deliberately bringing in a spiritual metaphysical angle. Did you have any sense of her as a being or a soul moving on and maybe talking to you? Or was it just end, the end, that was the end of her? I don't, I don't have any sense of her actually moving on in that way. But I don't feel that any of the people I know who have died are actually not there. You know, they, they always seem to be like up here <laughs> somewhere. There's a whole gallery of them and um, they're always with me. You know, that's now my mum, my dad um, and, and many other people. And the ones who are really significant, they're, they're sort of there looking over my shoulder and in a helpful way, not in a, not in a, a negative way. I mean, when my mother died, I had a distinct feeling. Three days after she died, I had this very, very distinct feeling of her or something coming into my heart. And it was so clear and real. Um, and I just thought, mm, you know, is, is, that, is that what resurrection is? Because it was like three days, you know. <laughs> there was something, I was like, oh, hi, mum, you know. And then she was in, inside of me and always has been ever since. <clears throat> so that's a very Christian perspective isn't it the, the three days and resurrection well it's the language that i i suppose i was used to yeah yeah mm. you, you then moved on and went educator counseling what did you specialize in particular areas oh in teaching in teaching and then counseling yeah yeah well for the teaching i um i got a job uh at a school on the strength of some work I'd done with them before, actually, when I worked for the Children's Society as a, as a fundraiser, I'd, I'd tripled the giving. And so the head decided that if I could do that, I could have a job at his school. Oh, and by the way, uh, your dad was a vicar, so will you take the lead on the RE? And I thought, oh, God, I wish I'd listened, you know. I wish I'd ta taken notice of, of some of the things. So then I had to do a master's in RE to just get up to speed. And um, so that's all been very helpful because it was a lot of multi-faith uh, work that we did. And, um, and that's really helped me in, in my work that I do now. And the, the counselling was, was sort of, um, I didn't specialise in anything particularly, but uh, it certainly helped me, I think, with listening and waiting and being able to feel things in the room being able to uh, act as an emotional container so that both in the meetings with families and and actually um at the funeral then i can can hold the space uh, i think so that's something that i've gleaned from that aspect of my experience those those would be minimal core skills for a funeral director wouldn't you think they ought to be at any rate the ability yeah. to hold the hold space and i think they should be but i don't know whether everybody understands um what they're doing you know they might be doing it but then haven't necessarily like i don't know i'm speaking for other people now yeah. i have no idea no idea um, when you were doing counseling were there any particular was there any particular pattern of uh, people that came to see you for help because a lot of a lot of counselors seem to attract a certain type of well, um, it's usually loss so yeah, was it loss yeah. yeah usually loss and I still do some some work but more so with groups um you know I've got something coming up later in the month uh with a yoga teacher that I've teamed up with and um also we're trialing something locally with public health which is going to be a group for um the funeral professionals for some kind of peer support so that's that's the way i 
I'm really doing that now rather than on an individual basis. Yeah. So how did you actually and why did you transition? I'm, I'm going to put it crudely because it's because I know it sounds quite humorous as well. You moved from live clients to dead clients, you know, one, ones that can't answer back. That, that's me putting a humorous frame on it. What, how, how, how did you, how, what guided you to make that move? What drew you to actually shift well, in that direction? I, it would be about 15 years ago, I think, that I started as a funeral celebrant. And um, that really happened because my then sort of partner, um, complicated story, uh, but he died and his daughter arranged the funeral, um, which was great. And it was taken by a humanist. And then another friend of ours had terminal cancer and he contacted me and said, um, the, who, who was the lady who took the funeral? And at this time I was working as an advisory teacher and thinking, you know, I've done, I've got a seven year itch I have with careers. So I'd, I'd done seven years in this one job or, or six and a bit. And I was thinking, oh, you know, time for a time for a bit of a shake up. And um, I, so this lady who took John's funeral, she was a retired head teacher. And um, I got in touch with her and I said, I'd quite like to do what you do. I've got a master's in RE and I've taught and I've this, that and the other. And she said, well, I, if we think you're the right sort of person, I can mentor you into the role, which she did. And started making funerals. Um, so that was, but um, that was with, you know, I was working with live people then because I was, wasn't touching the body. There was nothing to do really with the body. The only time I had any any contact was when they arrived on the day at, at the funeral in, in a coffin. So um, that was still all with, with live people. But reeling back a little bit, one of, what I wanted to do uh, when I left school really was to go into medicine. And I was drawn to pathology, you know. So, and I went with a friend of mine who'd got a place at, he was studying dentistry at uh, Birmingham Med School. And he took me to the, um, dissection rooms and I'll never forget that a huge room with lots of big slabs and lots of bodies on and it was you know a bit of a slight shock um but um but you know I've always had this interest in in doing things with with dead people so so, so let me kind of pause you right there mm. just, just 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 for a second because I'm, I'm curious and I'm sure some of the listeners will be too yeah. When you went into the space mm. with all the corpses, mm. I'm not used to that. So I can imagine going into that space and a kind of shudder rolling through my body simply because I'm not used to being with the vibe, the body vibe, the atmosphere of all these dead people, these corpses that are beginning to go into a decaying process maybe or whatever, right? How, how, how was it for you? I mean, did, did, did the fact that you'd been hanging out in graveyards when you were a kid, did that kind of inoculate you against that kind of startling experience? Or were you, were you comfortable with it? I can't remember. I mean, you know, it was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think... It was a bit, you know, you, I think always when you, the, the first few times that you, you go into a room where there are, where, where, where the body is no longer breathing, because that's the big, that's a significant difference. You know, there's, there's breath and there's no breath. And I think because it's so unusual, because we're not used to being in the presence of a, a body which isn't breathing, it does, it does sort of take you, take your breath, yeah, yeah, takes your own breath away a little bit. And there's a great sense 
of reverence and oh you know I need to just take a moment here and um and I think you do you do do that you do do that but then when you when you get more comfortable with being with dead bodies you it changes it does it has for me anyway and it's it's they no longer seem quite so dead if that makes any sense you know because the the mystery i think or the fantasy that we we create when we don't know much about something that that fantasy calms down and we can then become more practical and um do what we have to do as funeral directors. So just going back to the story, how I got to where, so I did celebrancy for umpteen years. And then about six years ago, we, my son and I started this funeral directors in Kidderminster, I'm sat in the office now, because the internet's better here than at home. And, um, and so that was when we really got to grips with having to deal with the physicality of death um so ask me ask me that question again so, so was it a an instinct or a career decision that actually or was it just a kind of natural flow that you went from counseling to grief looking after people who are, who are grieving and experiencing loss to doing some celebrancy at end of life and then training up as to do that celebrancy and then actually so it's, it's quite a shift to then actually work with the bodies isn't it well because i worked with lots of different funeral directors over um those years sort of 10 plus years i saw lots of ways of doing funerals because i was obviously i was asked to do mainly non-religious funerals Sometimes they were green burials, which are my favourites. Um, and um, I, I, I saw how different companies did, did the same kind of funeral and how different they could be. And, and I thought, well, actually, I'd like to, I would like to offer something more in our local area than we already have. So um, my son got interested in, in the work through the work that I was doing. And he's the one who's done all the qualifications and, and uh, you know, done all the book work. I didn't want to do that, done enough of that. And um, so he's done all that and he does all the heavy lifting. I can't really do that, but I do do, do a bit. I have actually been out on what we call an mm. uplift today. Um, I was thinking, oh, I hope I get back in time to, to do the webinar. <laughs> but anyway, I'm here, fine. By, 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 by heavy lifting, you mean lifting the corpse? Yes. Placing it in where, whatever it's going to be placed in. And well, I do. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, so I go along and, and, and help, but I'm not that much help. So he prefers to take other people. He only takes me when it's the last resort. Um, but... Um, yeah, so I don't know whether that answers your yeah, question. No, yeah, so, so, so you've moved, and now in, in your life story, you're actually working with dead bodies, and yeah. you're preparing them for cremation or burial. Mm -hmm. And there's a period of time between getting the body from where they died yes. to their last resting place whether that's a cremation or a burial yes and and in between you have them in your care we do and you're preparing them cleaning them mm -hmm. putting them in their coffins and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff mm -hmm. what's that like for you to actually be hands-on with dead bodies you know what, what is, is that like a, a a carpenter with wood or a craftsperson or is it 
what kind of relationship? What are you feeling? What's I, what are you sensing? I, I wouldn't say it was like well, not being a carpenter, I wouldn't really know. But um, I I think the best way to describe it probably is that it's a bit like we look. We look after people a bit like they're a guest in your house, really, except they're very quiet, um, very cold, very quiet, very well behaved, usually. And so would they come and stay with us for that sort of two week period? And we will tend to their needs, get them ready for viewing by family, if that's what family want. Um, or if not then they will still be prepared and put into whatever coffin the family have chosen um and it's it, it's a bit like you know they're part of the family for a, a little while because we're a family business anyway there's only there's, there's three of us um my, my son his wife and myself who um we're all sort of related and then um i share a house with um a lovely couple and um the male part of the couple he helps with uh removals and uh bearing and sometimes when we do christian community funerals he will come and help me uh do because christian community like their bodies to stay at home for three days so we'll go and prepare the body at the house and so then service each day you know check if they need any help with cooling ice you know yeah. has anything happened do we need to come and fetch them in quickly or you know things like that do, do the bodies have a presence like in my home if somebody comes through our front door mm. i feel as though i can sense mm. their vibe as they come into the house. Goodbye, bad vibe, intrusive vibe, but they take up space. Mm -hmm. They take up space. Are, are, are you, and that means I'm in relationship with them. Yeah. You know, at some level or another, right? So is what's happening for you with, with the corpse? Are you having a, a rapport like that? What's going on? Well, they're all different just people uh when they're alive that they but you can there are some some that are more have a a sort of um tranquility about them more so than others um and strangely sometimes when people have taken their own life they can have more tranquility than people who haven't well, that must be reassuring for friends of mm. the suicide to hear. Mm. So, listen, have you ever been spooked by the presence of any Me, of your spooked? You're joking, aren't you? I don't get spooked. <laughs> have, have you ever felt slightly weirded out, just, whoops, what's this, by any of the bodies that have come into your care? I, no. 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 Good. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Um... No. No. So listen, in our last conversation we had, you, you mentioned that, I think it was Brian Weiss's book, mm. Other Lives, Other Selves. Many Lives, Many Masters. Many Lives, Many Selves, had, um, had some kind of uh, intellectual influence on you. Um, yeah. So I'm taking it that there's a, part of your mind intellect psyche that's open to life after death the possibility of reincarnation and a, and a cycle of the, uh, the soul's journey so with that awareness so there, there you've got the body in your care mm. and you're having a caring relationship with that physicality that's not breathing mm. Do you ever have a sense of relationship with the soul that's on its own journey? Or are you kind of sending them on their way? Or I what? think more so when we actually get to the funeral. And I, I don't know. 
when we're here, it's all about in being in waiting. When we get to the funeral, that's a, a, like a, a rite of passage or a, a time for passage. That's how I feel anyway. And so then I will do a little bit of Reiki on the coffin, you know, to help people on their way. Um, so what do you think when you do the healing? Mm. What do you think is going on that's helpful? That it's kind of loosening things up so they can. It's disengage? helping the soul to move on. So the, the the love energy is helping the separation. To... Mm -hmm. Well, that's sort of you know that's I hope that's what's happening. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you can be sure. Um, but the 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 book by. Um, Dr. Brian Weiss uh, helped me make sense of working with dead people all the time. I think you have to have a strategy for your mental health, to, you know, for your sanity. And um, when I read his book and it was so clear that, that there was it seemed there was evidence of past lives and future lives from what he was saying, he being a skeptic and his client who we wrote the case study about being a skeptic, had to accept that she had had many past lives. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, sometimes you're asked to do a funeral of a 17 year old who seems to have had a very short life, but it's been, they've been like an angelic presence all their life and they've done lots and lots of good. And then you can do a funeral of a 70 year old who really you just think, well, what, you know, what's their life been about? What have they done? What, you know, and, or what good have they done? And, and I think to me, reading that book helped me to get it in perspective and to realize that the soul passes through many incarnations and it may be that you only need 17 years in this body to learn what you need to learn. And then it's time to go on into something else, whatever that may be, whether it be as a fly or a mouse or another human being or, you know, whether you get up to the angelic realms. Um, so it, it, it helps to make sense of the whole picture that... Um, we are just passing through and this this body that we have this container is is not not really that important you know but that that's a very profound and provocative thing to say that mm. this body is just a container um, would you like to see that kind of teaching with an orientation towards death happening very early on in people's lives. So there's a much more natural acceptance of death. Would you like to see that in well, RE at schools or for example? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what they're teaching in RE these days. They might, they might be, um, you never know, you know, they might be doing something, but um, yeah, I, th I think, I think it would do a lot of good. Maybe people would be less bothered about Botox injections and having false bottoms and boobs and you know, all that sort of stuff. I don't know. I don't know. So the, the kind of conversation we're having about um, the relationship with the body, the possibility of the soul's journey, all that kind of thing, when you are hanging out with other funeral directors, which I imagine you must do in professional bodies every now and again. Um, a little bit, not a lot. Not a lot. Yeah. But is this, kind, is this kind of conversation normal or unusual? I have had that conversations with... So it depends, you know. I've had a few conversations like that, but... Um, I don't. I don't really meet up with other funeral directors much, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but but maybe I will do in in April when I run this group. So I'll come back and tell you then. <laughs> 
what they say, but I'm sure everybody's got their own their own theory. But I've not sure, I haven't felt a lot of congruence, shall I say? I haven't, I haven't felt, um, I haven't felt drawn to talk to people in much depth about, or other funeral directors in much depth about what we're talking about here today. Yeah. It hasn't seemed particularly right. If I'm mixing with other funeral directors, it's because I'm doing a funeral, I'm taking a funeral for them. And basically, they just want me to get on with the job, do it properly, and, and everyone to be satisfied at the end of it. So, you know, it's... Yeah. Um, so th this, this is the impression I'm getting, because I've had a lot of emails since, you know, since we um, advertised that we were going to have this conversation. Yeah. And also, I've been doing the passing over workshops for, for decades as well. Mm -hmm. And I've been getting a lot of feedback and hints from people that their experience of, of the of funeral directors in general mm -hmm. is that um, they know how to put on a facade of um, solemn dignity mm. and careful listening yes but in actual fact there's a kind of um, almost a machinery in the background mm. which g given the number of bodies that might have been coming through for covid would be perhaps understandable i actually think it's probably more to do with the the firm that they're working for and um how they are expected to behave by some of the bigger companies or you know how they how they think they're going to keep their job whereas with us because it's just us we well you know we do we do whatever we feel is right at the time and we don't have a, a policy of you know you've got to do this you've got to do that we just do we go with go with how it feels right yeah because this this is the other sense i've been getting from people <clears throat> if folk want their own funeral to be nice mm, mm. or if they want a friend's a loved one's funeral to be harmonious and, and and appropriate they actually need to do the organizing themselves or they need to make sure that they have a good relationship with the funeral director mm -hmm. where they're able to discuss and unpack and explore mm -hmm. what the possibilities are um well when you know when i'm when i'm actually talking to people about the funeral itself i do say there aren't any rules you know there are no rules here the only one is really that we have to dispose of the body legally and that and that's about it uh, and everything else we can make up, do what we like. Um, so, and lot, often people say, well, I didn't know I could do that. And I didn't know I could do this. Well, you can, it's always worth asking. You might find that um, your funeral director isn't too keen to facilitate whatever it is you want to do. And, and there, might, there might be some good reasons for that because, you know, sometimes, um, it, it depends. Sometimes the body, you know, it, it might not be suitable for lots of viewing by lots of different people on multiple days. And, you know, the longer it's out of the fridge, you know, you don't want to go into too many details. Well, it, well I did do that. It, it decomposes if it's out of the fridge, doesn't it? That, well, if, if a body's refrigerated, they usually keep very well. But obviously, if you are bringing them out for... A period of hours at a time and then putting them back and in and out and in and out then you're going to get more more decomposition more rapid decomposition um but usually and and depends as well how quickly we get hold of bodies we don't do embalming because we don't believe that one it's necessary and two it's extremely invasive it's a horrible procedure it's it's toxic chemicals um and so we use refrigeration instead, whereas in the old days, I think embalming was used to keep people fresher for longer without a fridge. 
that's something that we don't feel is necessary. So, so, so that they could be viewed. Yeah, yeah. So, so essentially, at the moment in the UK, it's either cremation or burial, isn't it? At the moment, in the UK, it's cremate. Well, in Scotland, I believe they have a resonator which um, is a water, well, not water, I think it's a strong alkaline solution that is used to break down the, the body and then it's sort of filtered and filtered to an extent that apparently the water can go down into the sewage without any, any harm. Um, but we haven't, to my knowledge, we haven't got one in England yet, although they were trying to get one not far from us. Um, but uh, there isn't one. And over in America, there's a thing called Recompose, which is a, a, comp a rapid composting system, which is uh, quite interesting. But again, we haven't got one of those over here. So you've got to, you've got even within your um, cremation and burial, you've got choices there because well with cremation it's cremation is cremation you know mm. the only difference is whether it's early in the morning and nobody attends or whether it's later on in the day and you pay double and everybody can come. Um, it's uh, usually uh, uh, one after another after another, so you know you have to get in get out. But your other choices with burial are you can have a church a churchyard burial, which is possibly the greenest way to do it, because if you have it local, people haven't got to travel miles. Uh, that's one way. But you will have to have a service in church or a, or a minister from the church uh, to take the service. So that might not sit easily with a lot of people. Or you can go to a woodland burial ground and uh, bury there, which means you can spend all day on your ceremony if you want to. And uh, we've got a particularly good woodland burial ground, not, not near to us, they're all 20 miles away. We've got three, they're all about 20 miles away, but one of them is particularly good and has its own chapel. You can have the key the day before, you can decorate it with everything you want. You can have the key for the day after and you can go back and collect all your stuff and the grass is kept down by sheep grazing in the orchard it's absolutely wonderful yeah so, 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 so people need people need to research locally but what i'm what i'm hearing you say if if, if people want a bit of time in a crematorium chapel mm. they either need to go in early in the day or no buy, or buy more time they have to buy, you more, can time. buy more time all the or another way is to have a ceremony with the coffin one day, yeah. one evening even. And this is something we actually offer here for small numbers of people. So we'll have a, a, a little ceremony. Uh, family can do it themselves or I can say a few words if they want me to. And then the next morning we would take the... That, so that's the ceremony done. And then the next morning we can take the coffin for direct cremation. First thing, which is cheaper than later in the day it doesn't yeah. get you any time and you're not you're not allowed to family aren't allowed to attend yeah. so, so 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 tell you where we've gotten to at the moment I just, I just want to put in brackets here that a lot of us noticed that desmond tutu was um his, okay. his, his body was dealt with by a, a, a water freezing process which we haven't yeah. got yet on the uk and no. I, would, I would like that if we had that in the uk mm. but, but what i'm hearing partly what is something that I, I have a lot of conversations with over the decades with friends and people in approaching death situations is you have to plan. You, yeah. have, you have to make clear in what advance you what you want. And I have friends who've been very reluctant to have these conversations with their children or partners Mm. because their children or partners say, oh, I don't want to have that conversation. Don't spook me with that one, right? Mm. But you have to be very clear with them. Oi, I'm going, to, I'm going to go. This is what I want. Well, I think um, planning, planning is definitely an idea. Uh, uh, funeral plans, just on the financial side, we don't push funeral plans because we don't, we don't like them. We'd rather people pay at the time and have what they, which funeral director they want and what they want. 
Um, but that's a whole other area. But actually planning, going through a few, jotting down a few notes uh, is, is really, really helpful. And the other thing I think is so important, and this is something that I've strived for all of the time, the years I've been taking funerals, and it comes from the therapy background, is that the, the funeral needs to be he therapeutic and healing for the, the the mourners the people who are left and so they need to be able to do at that ceremony what they need to be able to do whatever that is and sometimes all getting involved and decorating the coffin beforehand I mean we've had some beautiful cardboard coffins that were decorated by family with pictures and pieces of music and uh, photographs and uh, flowers and all sorts of things so people can get really creative and they can spend hours and hours with the coffin not not with the body in you know because you have the coffin at home and do that and that's that's a really therapeutic activity and I can't stress this enough that I think people need to they need to think carefully about how they're going to be satisfied when the funeral's gone, are they going to be satisfied with what they said, what they did? Um, so that that's just another aspect yeah. that, that, you know, what, what who is a funeral for anyway, is yeah. another question. That, 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 that's a very poignant and difficult topic. I mean, as I plan my own funeral, I, I've been very clear, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. And I want it to be this simple. Mm -hmm. But I'm realizing that at the same time, there are people in my family. Who might not want that. Who, whose needs. Are not being met by that. Are not being met by my desire for a certain kind of simplicity. Mm -hmm. And then I go into a kind of little bit of a tizwas about, or am I colluding with their sentimentality? And in actual fact, this is going to be, yet another part of their own development. Yes. You know, hey, everybody's going to die. Mm. As you said half an hour ago, this dense physical thing is not really it. It's not, it's not us. It's not who we are. It's not who we really are. And I, in, in, a, in allowing people to other people to organise my funeral and go into their grief yeah. about losing this physical body i'm yeah. playing into mm -hmm. their belief that my physical body is all yeah. i am as opposed to i i have an inappropriate attitude a lot of the time which is fairly gung-ho about dying mm. you know people if, if you're thinking about the soul's journey the soul should be worried about incarnating you're incarnating into a very difficult planet. Mm -hmm. Who knows we're going to be your parents and your friends, the souls you're going to meet and all the rest of it. When you die, whoa, release, freedom. I'm back into a space where there's lots of things I like and can enjoy, right? And I don't know that I want to play into the sentimentality of people I know grieving, you know? I know they will experience loss, and I want to honor that. Yeah. You know, yeah, I understand that, because I experience loss when people I love die. Mm -hmm. But that's different from um, kind of Marcus. I don't know. Do, do, do you know what I'm talking uh, about? Yes, I do. I, 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 get, I get what you're saying, and it's really difficult, isn't it? It's a real double bind, because you you know okay you're you're at that stage in your soul's journey uh and that's what you that's fine for you so oh, you know don't I don't want any fuss and all this that and the other and actually saying that does give people permission not to make a lot of fuss so, uh, you know it, it is it is helpful because I think people do on the whole take notice of what people have said that they would like if if they've talked about it um and, but you know, those who are left behind might not be quite so well advanced and, or maybe even more advanced, who knows? So it's, 
I suppose you've got to watch it out there and 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 hope for the best. It's 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 an individual decision in negotiation with your family. Yeah, and and it's not going to happen if you don't start talking about it. Well, that, that's right. I mean, I I like very much the attitude that your death is your last great gift to your family and friends. Mm. That's your last action that can be generous and useful and developmental. And I like the advice to approach it with a bit of joy and a bit of courage. And then from that space, negotiate with your family. You know, negotiate with your family how how they're going to work with your body. But that's very idealistic, isn't it? I'm being very idealistic and people get very emotional. <laughs> I mean, most people leave no instruction whatsoever. Do they really not? Mm, no, they don't. They hardly say anything. They might you might get cremation or burial out of out of people, but you but other than that, families come come and they've just got to work it out, piece it together and oh, I, I, go, I go for what's safe. And you know, this is why we probably haven't got much real development in in I mean funerals are changing, but not much, you oh. know. Not really, really, much. really not. and and I think it's because everyone is afraid to to take that that risk of doing things slightly differently. So here's an irony: the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, at the moment is is definitely planning her exit. Yeah, absolutely yeah. planning it, and there's a troop of people around her planning the funeral. Mm -hmm. And she will have been involved in what hymns are going to be sung and which soldiers are going to march and how long the procession will be, whether it's going to be in Scotland or London or Windsor and all that, all that kind of stuff, right? Mm. So I think in, in terms of planning, she's, she, she's planning, it's, you know, we could say. And I think we could say to everybody who's listening to this conversation, mm. Plan now, make notes, mm -hmm. talk with your loved ones, tell them what you want. Start the conversation. Don't you think? I, d I do, but some people just don't want to think about it. They, d they don't want to go there. You know, they're not going to die, are they? Yeah. Yeah, but they've joined in this, listening to this particular dialogue. Oh, yes, so. everybody on here. Yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking, you know, just sort of... Um, Sorry, I was thinking on a wider, yeah, no, sure. wider level of. But it's got to it's got to start with you know if if, if people like us start to hor horrible horrible phrase if people like us don't do it, then how can we expect anybody else to do it? Mm. What have you planned, Kate? Me. Yeah. Well, I have got a place at that really nice burial ground that I spoke of earlier. Yeah. Um. So that's sort of plan A. But I don't know. Um, things might change. Uh, could get buried in the field behind the house. Uh -huh. We'll have to see. Uh -huh. can to my son, he, he can <laughs> the decision, I think. How deep do, do you have, does the body have to be under the earth to be legal? You know. Well, it doesn't, there isn't a legal. Um, um, there isn't actually a legal limit. Um, if if you're going to have a double grave, then it would be it would be dug six foot deep. If you're going to have a single four and a half, it depends a bit on the kind of soil that you've got as well. Um, but I think you can. I don't want to be quoted on this, so I'm not going to say what you can get away with. But the shallower the grave, the better for the environment, because obviously what you want is the aerobic activity to to break things down, and that won't happen if you go very low down. So most burials, you know, bodies will take longer than would be desirable. So what do you see as the the, the general future for green funerals and did you see a pattern emerging about you know how long after somebody dies before they should be buried? For me, it's get it done as 
rapidly as possible without upsetting the family mm. and then do it as green as possible in whatever way that is for mm. you locally mm. and whether you have a personal preference for burial or cremation because those, those are the only two choices at the moment mm. in England at any rate um, but could I be taken out to sea and dropped in the ocean yeah yeah you can have a um Burial, let's see. All right, so I, so I could have that as well. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. So everybody needs to, I, I'm happy to be cremated quickly. Um, put me in a cardboard oh, box. Cremation quickly. You see, you have to wait for the paperwork to come through. That's the thing. So you've okay. got a registrar. You know, first of all, you've got a doctor to, to sign something, and then they've got to contact the registrar. Then the registrar has to contact you. And then you'll have a telephone conversation with the registrar who will then issue the green form to us. We can then go ahead with the burial, but we still have to have some more paperwork from the doctor for a cremation. But for a burial, we only need the green form, as it's called. So burial is more simple. Paperwork wise, it's great. In fact, the family don't even have to fill in a form. Okay. Or sign anything. Whereas with a cremation, you have to sign to say all the information that you've put in that form is true. Otherwise, it's a criminal offence. And how, so, what's the shortest amount of time to get the cremation paperwork through? Uh, we've we've done we've ooh. if if the doctors are primed, uh, you can do it within about four days, five days, working days. I mean, we have done, I remember we did a, a burial where, not a burial, a cremation where the gentleman died at home, was kept at home for several days. And we went and fetched him, put him into his coffin at home and then did the cremation uh, and that was all that was all done within, I think, three days, four days, yeah. because the crematorium have to have the paperwork two days before, okay. because a medical referee has to look through that to make sure okay. it's OK. So and, it, and, it, it, it's it, it's yeah. not as easy as, you know, yeah. and the body needs to be kept somewhere in between. Yes. Which is why it needs to be somewhere where there's a fridge enough cold enough room for the yeah, whole. If you in the winter, you can keep at home for a few days, but, you okay. know. There might be, it might start to get a bit unpleasant. Yeah. And there are people who are worried about cremation polluting because of the smoke. Mm -hmm. is, is that a real thing? Are there any crematoria which have filters? They all the have smoke? filters. They all have massive filters. So does that make a difference to their pollution? Well, I think the carbon footprint's still there. It doesn't matter how clean your filters are you're still burning lots of fossil fuels all right so the the pollution bit the the ungreen bit is the fact the energy that's being used to dispose of the body mm. all right because i thought it was the actual smoke well there's lots of filters on to stop mercury getting out and various other all right so if i do if i do some carbon offsetting yeah, yeah, but carbon offsetting, that's a whole other. <clears throat> Don't get me on that. Don't, Don't get, get you on that. Because right. <laughs> we'll need another two hours. All right. All right. So I, so I couldn't just plant some trees and be cremated and feel as though I've got it balanced. You can you can you can do that, but it's not planting trees to balance out our bad habits. Okay. Isn't the answer to, isn't the answer, is All right, it? so th there was a time, I remember 40 years ago, when, when people were saying that it was polluting the earth to have all the human dead bodies decomposing That's in it. That's nonsense, isn't it? Well, 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 well we've always had, the whole earth is a compost here. Well, we've always had death around us, and death and decay is normal. And if it wasn't there, we wouldn't survive anyway, because we need... Things, you know, we need the leaves to fall off the trees and form leaf mould and then provide fertiliser for the for the next generation of, of growth. And, and our bodies are just the same. Great, because this disabuses me. Chat, chat, I'm not a Brummie. I'm black. No. <laughs> well, 
What, what, what do you want that corrected as your uh, what? Sure, ice. <laughs> Kidderminster. No, Black Country. I'm, black I'm Country. All right, know. Chris, Chris Richards, not a Brummy, but Black Country. So you've just abu disabused me of, of a wrong thought I've had for decades, which is I was told that with you know, 8 billion people on the planet, with everybody being buried in the ground, we were creating another little ecological disaster because of the pollutants in the human body. Well, that could, uh, that could be the case. But I think it, I don't know, I'd have to, maybe that's the subject for a PhD. Okay. <laughs> you see, there's um, Sohini, I'm just kind of, I'm reading the um, chat box as they come along. I was saying, Paula Graham, can you see her note, um, Kate? I hold funerals. Oh and recently gave an education session for staff where I work at a hospice. One session was specifically on swift funerals. Yeah. Jewish, Muslim, some Sikh, et cetera, have chosen this. Some have been done within a day of death. Yeah. Are these burials? Or... They, they may, they will be burials, I think, Jewish. And yes, you know, if the authorities will get the paperwork through in time, then that may be able to happen. But for most people who don't have a religious reason and where, you know, they won't, they won't be able to put, if everybody wanted to do that, I don't know how the registrars would get would hand, through. Would handle the paperwork. And also, you know, the, the reasons behind the paperwork is partly, we, we used to have to have two lots of forms for a cremation. But over COVID, they dropped it to one. And the re I think the reason for two doctors to have to, one has to sign, the, the regular doctor is supposed to give the cause of death, and then another doctor has to verify their, their decision. And, come and do, they come and do an inspection of the body, which is very brief, I have to say, but they don't do that anymore. And I think that was brought in because of Harold Shipman and his shenanigans. Um, but... You know, these checks and balances are there because later on people might think, oh, well, you know, maybe there was some foul play or something. So the paperwork needs to be in yeah. place. Right. It's so, not, you know, it's... Yeah. So, so listen, we're, we're coming to the end of our conversation. Mm. Here's, here's a last question for you. Um, I, I would have handed it over to Sini, but I can't see a load of questions in the chat box. Um, no, there's only one question, which was, what don't we know that we could do at a funeral? Sorry, what? What things don't we know about that we can do at a funeral? What things don't we know? Well, I would say the human mind can't conceptualize the negative, so I'm not sure what you mean. But um, what do you want to do? I would say, what do you want to do? Let's talk about that, not what you, what you yeah. don't, you know? Okay, so it's really, it's really, just allow yourself to imagine. Allow, let the, yeah, let the yeah. imagination go. go. And then, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. What, I, what I heard you say, Kate, was yeah. apart from the actual cremation and the burial, there's absolutely no law around what you can and cannot do. You have to dispose of the body legally. That's it. Lawfully. So the two ways at the moment in this country are um, cremation or burial. But yeah. uh, you can do all sorts of, of ceremonies with the coffin we're not allowed to parade a coffin a, a body around that's on view mm. so you have to have a lid on um in public could, could it be a glass lid i i think it's is it that old public decency thing is that, it? Right, so something to play? i'm not i'm not sure yeah it's a big thick expensive book on death and the law and I keep thinking I ought to buy it really having done a law degree many moons to go I really ought to I ought to polish up on my law um but uh, but I haven't so um yeah I think you, you, you know it's just not to offend anybody yeah. but if you're in private then mm. all right so so my naked body on a throne being carried down the high street is not going to be legal. No, and that's not your minimalist approach you, either. 
if you're, if, well, I think, no, not if you're dead. It might be legal if you're alive, so long as you wore something yeah. like oh. I, 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 I temporarily lowered the tone. Here, here's his last question for you, Kate. Mm -hmm. If you could wave a magic wand, how would you like to see the whole funeral business moving in the next 10, 20 years? What would it look like? I would like to see good quality natural burial grounds available for around every town you know we here we have to travel 20 miles to one of three different ones that's too far we need them you know this is this town is surrounded by fields uh we could drive two miles away and you could be in the countryside so we need more proper natural burial grounds we need them easier to get you, you know without lots of newt surveys and all the other stuff that stop you doing things so i just like to see more choice more opportunity for people to um to do things more organically right. because the more people know about it the more people will want it yeah i, right. I believe that's a that's a that's a very helpful thought so we know we know what for doing a little bit of nudging and campaigning. And I think it's much more healing, to, you know, the green burials that I've done, you get a sense of, of wholeness, completion, and, you know, it's just so much more satisfying to be able to spend the day somewhere than, than just 40 minutes and then feel you've got to clear off because the next one's coming in. I think this can all be done. Great. If there's a will. Thank you. Thank you so much for a really interesting conversation. Sahini, have you got anything you want to say before we close? No, this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. And um, it just, yes, I have my own stories of coming through and my conversations with my dad about what he wants and how my mom doesn't agree so oh, yeah. it was very yeah so very good thank you both no, was... and, um... okay thank let's let's take a oh, minute yes what's kate's website oh kate's website the address is do you want me to put it into yes please it's, it's atwoodfunerals.co.uk isn't it a double yeah. TT. And you can contact me via that if you've got any other questions. Um, yeah, just put it in the chat box. Yeah, I've done it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So that's one. Let's take. Um, um, actually, just to say, in a month's time, we've got Paul Gilbert, yes. Professor Paul Gilbert, the author of The Compassionate Mind, having this conversation with us. And can we take a minute's quiet just to close this evening? Um, I was going to spring on you, Kate. Do you have a prayer that you like? Do you have a favorite prayer that you like to end? Oh, God. With ever? If, no, if, 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 I was, if, if not, I'm happy to do something to close it. But if you've got something that springs to heart. Uh, no, I. No. No, not, uh, not that I can remember without scrabbling around. Oh, and all right. So let, let, me, let, me, let me do it then. So everybody, let's just take a, a final minute silence together. And um, first of all, thanks to Kate for um, a very insightful, honest, transparent and useful conversation. And thanks too for this time and this space together and all the beings, seen and unseen who support us. And as we all of us, without exception, move towards that great end of life transition, may that journey be Beautiful, graceful, and blessed.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Lots. Thank you. Thank you for community. Thank you. Thank you for love. Thank you for inviting me. Oh. Thank you for being here. <laughs> bye bye.